Well, then in that case, we'll introduce um, John Hoopenball and Nye Wang. So they're here, they're going to be doing fluency training. It is today focused mostly on grades two through four. Um, Eric, we of course would like you to stay because yeah. we didn't have you last year, but everyone else, if they feel comfortable using fluency in K1, we're not doing it with you guys this year. So you all are welcome to head out. So if you do that quickly, busting your area. Now, before Fifth and Sixth leave, I actually have a section for you guys to say something. So if you <coughs> can, oh. I, would, I would like you to stay at least for the first five to ten minutes. Superintendent of Public Construction for Arizona. And while I was superintendent um, from 2011 to two, through 2014, we started a project. It was codenamed Free Throws. And we brought together researchers and we brought in all the latest research on memory, learning, and especially motivation to see if we could create a math environment where students moved academically faster than they had ever moved before. And we also brought in the IT division and uh, had them start writing the computer code to create this environment. We, when we got this constructed, we went down to Sunnyside School District down in Tucson, um, a highly at-risk school, uh, school district, and we went to the Liberty Elementary School, one of their most at-risk schools, and we had a group of, uh, a classroom of students come together, and in one Saturday, the students did 38,000 math problems in this environment. So we were knew we were on the right path, but we also knew that, that we needed more. So when I left the department after that four years, I ran into Super Geek here, and he agreed to take over the project and support it. And so we went into a period of development at that point where we kept refining it, going back to that body of research and, and scoring numerous breakthroughs. So. <clears throat> All right, so that's, that's the history of it, and Super Geek is my, uh, it's my secret identity, so don't share with anyone else. Um, so once I take my glasses off, then that changes everything. <laughs> All right, so for the agenda now, uh, we're just going to just kind of let you know what this hour is going to bring for you. So we're going to first ask, like, who's new to Porter here? So who are the new teachers? One, two, three. Awesome. Woo! <laughs> So, so for, for those of you, this will be your first uh, introduction to this program. For the rest of you, I know that you guys sat through our presentation initially when we first uh, told you about it. Uh, you'll be, we'll be reviewing a lot of the information, but we also discovered new things that uh, happened throughout the year last year as we expanded our program from one to two schools to, to 200 classrooms around the country. And we Another started. huge breakthrough. Yeah, yeah so, so, so it's like this is a constantly evolving process. Like we, we thought we knew one thing, and then we learn something new, and then we just keep coming up with new discoveries as you guys use this tool and come up with and, and find new ways to reach these students. So uh, we're going to have you guys share and tell about last year, so the fifth and sixth grade teachers who had a chance to uh, run it for a couple months. Uh, we're going to introduce the Math Fluency Project, uh, talk about the science of learning, motivation, brain research, and cultural permanence. So a lot of the science. Because we feel that once you know, understand the science behind everything, it's not, it's not like, you know, if we were just to hand you a pencil and say, do something with it. Okay, well, if you understood a little bit more about the, the pencil and, and what, what it makes, it makes it work, then you would be able to do more with it, like that, or a knife, or a, or a chalkboard, or any kind of technology. So instead of just thinking of it as this, as this blunt instrument, you'll be able to use it like a fine uh, scalpel. Um, we're going to talk about what's new. Uh, we added some new features that have uh, definitely 
uh, helped out help the students a lot. And then we have, and then back to where I stated, like the new phenomena that we observed and we're trying to implement this year uh, uh, and ways to, to reach the kids. And then we're going to go into the training on the program. So the, so the first portion will probably take about half an hour, and then the training will take, take up the last half hour. Um, and uh, we'll do it. OK, so uh, show and tell. Let's share your experience. So fit for you, uh, for the fifth and sixth grade uh, teachers, what was the biggest accomplishment that you saw from using this program last year with your students? What was the biggest like, observation, yeah. aha <laughs> moment? What, what, yeah. Well, I'm just, um, I'll give you an example. One kid was struggling with, I'm trying to remember the concept, but he was, he, it was the concept he was struggling with. I don't remember what it was. And after using the, after using fluency, I could see his growth in the program, and then I could see him applying it outside of the program. So that's the kind of thing. And it wasn't like this huge turnaround time. I would say within a week or so of being on fluency, he was, he was starting to see the growth. So I think the positives of it are, is the quick turnaround mm -hmm. and getting the concept. Yeah, absolutely. So immediate, actionable results. And that's one of the best parts about this is like, when we are when we're going to talk about this, we're building these foundational skills, and you're going to see immediate results, and then it's going to continue to compound over time. Um, so that's that's a great example. Anyone else uh, had any really big accomplishments or observations that they saw from their students last year? I think for us, it was more of the change their identity from, um, you know, put it bluntly, the I'm stupid kind of thing to, wow, I can be successful, I can do this. So one of the big things that the program does is it gives every child success. And that is just what the research is finding out is that giving a child a lot of success is so yeah. critical. And we'll be going over that, that scientific principle here, but yeah, that's one of the biggest resu uh, net results from that. We see immediate results, and then we see the confidence, which actually, dovetails into more than just math. It goes into their uh, all of uh, education experience. Anyone else like to share something really awesome that you saw last year? Um, something that I really enjoyed is that it um, is intuitive to um, the child's learning. So if somebody is really high in math, then um, they can keep excelling because the problems will get um, more challenging. Um, if they're lower in is that it brings them together as a team, and they have a clear sense that they're accomplishing as a team, but it also creates then incentives who can put the most points on the board for the team. So it's competition, but it's not destructive competition. In scientific terms, it's called, it's called a non-zero-sum game. A lot of life is revolving around zero-sum games, in which individual achievement is actually a destructive side effect, but in this, individual achievement has no destructive side effect. So the smart kids can race away without taking away from any other student's experience. So this is great, and a lot of these things we're going to talk about through our basically our research presentation. But now you heard uh, from teachers who actually not only understand the research but experience the net result of that. So so it's not just like 
pie in the sky like theory. It's, it's real grounded and it, it, it really works, but it requires you to be there and, and, and to be on top of it. So let's uh, go into the other side of things. Uh, what was your biggest pain point when you guys were running it uh, last year? What, 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 what uh, challenges did you have that, that you either overcame or didn't, didn't, didn't overcome? So right? for me, I just forgot how to like reset the, the okay. main goal. And I didn't remember how to find that out. Okay. So I, what would be helpful would be if there was like a little like get help here box for the teacher to be able to type in how do I reset the main goal kind of thing. Yeah. You know, so, so you know, just some little quick like without me having to email you and then yeah. wait to check my email. You know what I mean? Like yeah, we have a quick. better documentation now than cool. we did last year. Yeah. So, so that was the thorough. only thing that was Great. a pain. And the fact that the kids wanted to do it all the time. Yeah. And, but, <laughs> okay, that's a good pain for you guys, but it was like challenging. Yeah, because they got to move on. Yeah, because we got other things we have to do or, you know, so. Right, yeah. Anyway, so that well, was, you couldn't ask for a better testimonial about math than that. Right. <laughs> um, so the biggest pain point for me was I'm a fairly tech savvy person. And I, your, the, the format of the site is not, was not easy for me to follow. And like Amber mm -hmm. said, yeah. being able to set goals and to actually see where individual kids were, it just, it wasn't intuitive. It yeah. didn't just pop up. Still so that was a process. struggle for me. <laughs> yeah. And then also, um, kids getting kicked out. They'd be in the middle of working, 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 next thing you know, they're kicked out. Yeah. And they don't, they, they didn't do anything. They just were not in the program anymore. Yeah. No. Yeah, I think we, we we did some really major overhauls this summer, so that was one of our big things to try and mitigate that. Although there are still ways that kids can get themselves kicked out. Okay. But, but okay. <laughs> we'll keep an eye on that. Great. Another those are thing those in those situations, I and I was working with the second grade class this morning, and I just said, okay, let's just go through the logout process again, and and if they know, okay, boom, just log right back on in, uh -huh. and I'm and it kept my points, and so I just keep right on going. So eventually, yeah. if something like that does happen, it's a 30 second, 45 second interruption, and you can get back in. Awesome. But any, hopefully it'll happen a lot less. Any, any other comments uh, from this side of the room? I think the time and getting logged in was something that we struggled with at the beginning, and by the end, um, they could get the hang of it, but it just it took a little bit longer than we had expected yeah. getting started. And we, so I'm doing second graders, mm -hmm. so, who are the second grade teachers again? Over there. Okay, so I, I think we're gonna come to this, but we might as well talk about yeah. it now because you brought it up. So second grade to me, and Nye and I get into some fierce arguments about this, but the second grade to me is the place where we really need to be because we gotta catch them and get them fluent at second grade and then they'll be ready. I think my belief is, is if we can catch, if we can get 95% of the students to standards at by the end of third grade, if we catch them in second, but as you indicated, I'm going. I'm I'm teaching a hugely at-risk student class of second graders, and so I'm doing two second grade class, and one is at risk, Title One, but it's not quite as at risk as the other. So the first day we come in, it takes an hour and five minutes to get them logged in. So <laughs> I thought, oh wow, this will never work. Not, they're going to throw me out of the school. Okay, so fast forward, we're now here, day twelve. They set a new record, six minutes. So we went from an hour and five down to six minutes in 11, 12, 12 days on the 12th day. A really old so, Android tablet. So too. understanding this, but also we turned that login experience into an educational experience in its own right, in which they conquer this monster machine on their desk and have all the power to themselves. So we turned that into an educational, and we also, sort of allowed us to be at peace. Because if you go in there the first day and it's an hour and five, I can't imagine, I can't tell you the, the pain I felt of that and think, realizing that the project was probably gonna fail. And then, and then but they, the school stayed patient with me. And so now here we are, only six minutes to log in. But we set objectives. We let them know how long it was taking, an objective every day for setting a new record. And then I did this. Any of you familiar with the rock band Queen? And, um, so when he did the Live Aid concert, he would go, hey, yo, and the audience would go, hey, yo. Well, we go, LMS, L. So we do this, we take them through the whole login routine using that queen thing of 
of just saying it out loud. Or you guys could just use shortcuts. <laughs> and they, uh, yeah, so there might be technical knives. To, so I'm the old fashioned guy. We just type in the LMS and we, we go through. But by doing those things, you turn that login experience into an educational experience in, in his own right. My belief is, well, I'm seeing the motor skills of these second graders come along. I believe eventually we'll get them down to a minute. And uh, so essentially we will we'll have taken them from 65 minutes to one minute. And uh, so it is, I'll admit, it is agony. In that hour and five, I had two other people there helping me. So it will be, I just want to brace yourself, but it's comparable. I'm doing the one class by myself, and I did the other class with two helpers. Let me assure you, two helpers, if you can get two parents to volunteer to help you for, to go first through weeks. that first 11 days. Anyway, that's so, a, a lot about it, but it is, you got to the essence, essence of it is. Those students now, those second graders, this morning, they did over 5,000 math problems each. They did <coughs> over 250 math problems correctly each. That's on, so we're out here now, day, day 12. So it's a very, it's the very simple stuff in the beginning, but there's not a, a math, other, there's not another math class in the United States that's doing five, you know, 5,000 math problems a day. So uh, what, uh, what uh, grade are they introduced to their uh, Chromebooks? Is it second grade or is it? Uh, introduced to what? Chromebooks or whatever the they have so they're so introduced they have in kindergarten. By second grade, they can use them. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, they, so you know, so it's not something that's completely foreign to them, but yeah, it, it does take time to get them acclimated. And we have methodologies and things okay. to help shortcut that. Uh, and especially since you're using uh, Active Directory, it, uh, passwords can be saved too. Websites and passwords can be saved. So, so that that will, that will shave off a big amount of time. Uh, so when I, when he says Active Directory, that has meaning to you. I'm old school. I mean. <laughs> so yeah. you probably can, the, the, the problems that I talked about, that's how I, you probably can get through that a lot faster. Yeah. So, um, and uh, just really quickly, what are you looking forward to this year uh, with, with the program that, you know, just for the? Probably getting that number sense, or let's see, earlier in the year. Yeah. It was introduced later in the year last year. I mean, you know, through your program, but getting it. Now you can have a full year's yeah. worth of. And, and there's a lot of really cool things that will happen. And last year we did it at the end of the year because we wanted you to have some experience with it and then you have, then you, then you can actually think of some strategies coming into this year. Great, anyone else like to say something about what you're looking forward to? She said it. Oh, she said it. <laughs> ditto, 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 ditto. Okay, awesome. So this is a, 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 a kind of like a new saying uh, from one of my dear, dear friends, Ray McNulty. Uh, he does uh, consulting uh, with schools all around the country, model schools. But he's saying that he's telling us that we're not teachers anymore. We're a learning engineer. So think of yourselves as learning engineers. And you're here to get the learner to develop their skills. So I'll let you guys read that. But that's something that we want to uh, basically instill in all teachers now is that you are learning engineers. You are pioneering new ways and new methods. It's not just about what you learn in school anymore about the different pedagogies, but it's in this environment, you need to be highly adaptive. You need to be able to work with whatever tool sets that are given to you, and then come up with something new and become engineers and inventors at the same time. So that's something that's really empowering, because, like, because as an engineer, you are doing some amazing things. So not just a teacher, but learning engineers. So I'm gonna take a picture there. Okay, great. Awesome. So uh, teachers, or should I say learning engineers. All right, so let's just go a little bit of a history. You know, in 2016, we did our first test class of the current version of the program. You know, it goes way back before that, but when, when, uh, when I came involved, basically I said, okay, that was a, you know, a great foundation. Let's scrap the whole thing and build, build, <laughs> build it up from, from, with using new technology. So we started with the South Phoenix School where it was the, you know, one of the highest crime, highest poverty uh, uh, zip codes in the, uh, in the state uh, with a fourth grade class. So, uh, so uh, I know a lot of you have seen this video before, but this is always very inspirational. This is Durrani, and here he is after about two months um, in the program. Now this is also a very early version of the program. It's not as uh, good as it is now, but still, uh, you'll see the results of it.
Can everyone see in the back there? Now you notice his buddy over here is going as fast as he is. So it's not just one student. So I'm going to start over. I'm going to see. So you see that, you know, this is a high so level see, so A three term problem. Each green square means he's getting an answer correct. And uh, sometimes it's addition, sometimes it's subtraction. But the most important thing, you'll notice that the x is moving on both sides of the equation. So, you know, we'll, we're so familiar with the single format <laughs> system. And the kids just get, get into that routine. But by moving it back and forth, it actually further challenges their brain and exercises it in such a way that we've, we're finding very unique benefits from so that's the uh, that's like basically at about two months or into the program. So he ended, he, in this example here, he did 61 correct in a minute, and when he was on single digit work, he's up doing these three terms. When he was on single digit uh, problems, he would do 81 a minute. So we tried our best to figure out how he was doing it because I'm a touch typist since high school, engineer, been doing numbers my whole life on a keyboard. And I played this game hundreds of times, and my high speed was 58. So he's at 81. So this is a student who, when I went around this class at the beginning of the year, I asked each one, what's 5 plus 4? And not a single student could say 9. They, about two-thirds of them could do it on their fingers. I had four students who scored 0 on AZ Merit. So it was really highly at risk. And so they went from that to this in very short order. Yeah, it was incredible. So here he is uh, two months later, and let's just kind of show you where his progress is now. So now we're looking at four term problems instead of three terms. And did you get any of you guys experience kids who were like basically rocketing through problem types like that? Oh, Marianne. Oh, she was phenomenal. Fernando. It's just incredible how we can reprogram the brains. Anyone stop on one of them? So you can see in this example, 16 minus 3 is 13. 10 plus something is 13, so x equals 3. And he, can, he gets to where he can just do those just like that. So he got 56, right? I mean, and we're, you can see, too, we're bringing words in. So instead of the... The plus symbol, we're putting PLUS, and eventually we're going to have versions of this software that are nothing but words. There are no numbers at all, because we want them to start getting ready for real word problems and be able to use the linguistic side of the brain as well as the numerical side to, uh, to work on everything. All right, so here he is um, about uh, another couple weeks or so later. Um, so here we go. Okay, go. Okay, so you can see Chroma needs a total of $19. If Chroma has $11, he needs X more. 19 to minus 11 is 8. X equals 8. So it gets them in this idea. It, it gets their reading skills going. So now, now that we've seen progress, uh, you know, so basically our foundation comes in the form of the nine scientific principles. So these are, these are critical to understand why is this software different than other software? Why is this a different environment? And these nine scientific principles are critical. So principle number one, breakthrough on this, the human brain was meant to <coughs> be revolve around a team score. Mm -hmm. It was, we're not, we're get to that, so well, the first thing we're going to do is set a foundation okay. before okay. we get to the principle. Sorry about that, John. Um, so basically, you know, a lot of this comes from game, uh, from game gamification and game theory. So I just want to briefly talk about how the entertainment industry has programmed our kids on how, how they are designed to receive information. So back in the old days, when television was first introduced and you know, Fire and Brimstone was coming down because everyone was misbehaving. 
So what would, what, what would you do, what would your parents do to get you to quiet down or or, or focus? They would put you in front of the television, and then usually it's like cartoons. So you would be growing up watching cartoons like Mickey Mouse, Smurfs, Felix the Cat, SpongeBob, or whatever. So so during that time, you know, you were learning that okay, in order for me to uh, pay attention, I'm going to sit down in front of this TV and I'm going to be entertained by these characters. So you get enamored by these characters, you have to love them. Uh, and then you go to school, and then you go to school, what happens is you're, you have a teacher standing in front of the classroom, and they're talking at you, and you, you remember growing up, like, okay, this is what I'm supposed to do. I sit in front of the television, I watch the story being told to me, uh, and this, this makes sense. So for them, you know, that the uh, entertainment industry was actually programming the kids that this is how I receive information passively by television, and, um, and that's, how, that's how I get the information. So come fast forward to the 80s and 90s uh, with the introduction of uh, video games, uh, things suddenly took a change. So instead of being entertained by a television set where you sit there and you watch whatever programming is, has been given to you, you are now playing these video games. So you're playing like Pokemon, uh, Legend of Zelda, with Link, uh, Super Mario. Anybody like Super Mario here? Yeah, <laughs> awesome. Uh, Sonic the Hedgehog. So basically, you know, you become a nanner and identify yourself with these characters as, as these avatars, but instead of being sitting there passively taking on the information, now you have a controller. So you're actually making a decision, making, uh, controlling the avatar's destiny, finding out you know, how to finish a level, and the first time you do it, you might get one star, or you might get 500 points, but then you go, okay, I can do it again. Next time you do it, you got 800 points or two stars. But the thing is, you, you learn through the process, and then you start to improve yourself. And you also have the choice to make, like, you know, do I want to go through that level really fast? Do I want to go through that level really well? Do I want to do this? And you can also go back and revisit these levels if you want and make personal challenges. So they had all these choices and these uh, decision-making abilities uh, during, for their entertainment. And they go to school, you're sitting in these nice neat rows, uh, and the teacher's lecturing at you. What happens? They're like, oh, this does not compute. Uh, at home, this is how I got my information. I got, uh, I have, you know, I played a video game, I can make decisions, I have control, I can do, do things multiple times. But then there, there's a the teacher say, okay, you know, and I'm sure you probably had a couple of these growing up, I'm only gonna say this once and once only, and this is the only time I'm gonna say it. If you miss it, if you don't write down the notes, then you're out of luck. <laughs> so, so that whole entire shift changes the entire modality of how these kids are designed to take on information, you know, take it on through multiple passes through different decisions, making choices, getting achievements, and all that kind of stuff. So that's, so in, in education, we need to kind of like mimic, but not recreate video games. Mimic and mold a lot of our instruction to that. So that's basically one of the core foundations of how uh, the Math Fluency Project or Fluency works, uh, is because we take a lot of these core principles and then we're bringing this math information, which hasn't changed in thousands of years, into a new format that the kids can compute. Okay, so we want to just kind of show you this really quick, just kind of show you what happened when we ran this thing for a year. So this, the average gain on the AZ merit test um, from the end of third grade till the end of eighth grade is 25 points a year, plus or minus a couple points. And what we were able to do in that laboratory class that Durrani, you saw the video of him, we, they were able to get 44 points average. They, it was this huge study out of Stanford in which they ranked every school district in the nation. The top 1% of, of districts would have gotten not 25 points, but 32. So we were able to get 44 points. And that school went from being a D slash F school to a B school in one year, based on the academic gains of the students. So these academic gain data, the scale score data, data is crucial for the well-being of the child, but it's also crucial for the well-being of the school they, they now give you credits for your letter grade for the uh, academic gains of your, um, of your, um, of your English language learner students for every category. So you're getting double, essentially double points in a lot of regards for your academic gains as well as for your whole student population. So this was no small feat. Now my classroom management skills are not the best. I'm betting that every single one of you is a better classroom manager than I am. So we believe that we can actually do better than this in, in uh, uh, moving out in the future. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 
have an actual teacher to use it. <laughs> so, uh, so if you notice here, we have three students here who gained 100 points. That represents four years of growth in one year. It's incredible. And if you notice down here, we had like a, whole, a few students here who didn't meet the, the, the average. And uh, but that's okay because these were special ed students. So they, they still showed academic growth through the whole process. And we're going to be uh, talking about how this affects uh, special, ed, special needs uh, students as well. So that's just kind of like, so we want to see this, but we want to see double this this year. So, so we're, we're uh, really hoping that. And, and actually, this is very interesting data. It's coming from uh, Taylor Junior High. Do you guys feed into Taylor? Yes, yes. Awesome. Taylor's so, our feeder. So they, so they, they picked yeah. it up this year as well. So during the summer, they said, okay, we want to try it and we want to run it during our summer school. So this is a three weeks, three week summer school program. This is when they, the ki this is what the kids tested uh, upon entry. This is what they did after three weeks. So that, for us, we were, we, we could not believe those numbers. Yeah. We were like, is, is this made up of, we, but John was there and he saw them implement the test and this is the data they got back. It's yeah, like, I mean, the numbers are too good to be believable. I just was there, I saw them implement the post-test and they did it very rigorously. And uh, so the students, the percentage of students meeting the uh, district standards went up astronomically. Um, anybody who knows academic data knows that data is too good to be true, but that's what they measured. And they had exceptional teachers running the program. That's and crazy. the students were doing, they were doing well over 200 math problems a day. Yeah, we were like, this is not possible. This in three weeks. But speaking to like, you know, how you saw immediate results from, from going through a program, they, they did that too. It just really creates these, uh, these new linkages in their brains. All right, so. So, so basically, it all kind of circles back to this, the beacon of learning. What we're trying to do is we're trying to create permanence in, in learning through this methodology. So, so it all, all goes back to uh, a theory that we started with, which is the, based on our ancestors in the Plains of Serengeti. So the way we were all originally designed over billions of years is we were a team. And if we were a successful team, we ate steak. And if we weren't successful, well, then we starved. So there was a lot at stake every time we went out in our teamwork. And that's the breakthrough here, is we have that team goal up there. It grips the imagination. It's why we love football and basketball so much. And so, and that, it also, the other aspect of this that feeds into this, it turns out that the number one function of the brain is to forget. The brain is an expert at forgetting. And, and once you understand that, everything becomes more obvious. It, the brain is looking for specific signals that tell it to store memories with dendrite growth instead of chemicals. So as I look out here, and I'm just looking at this right here, there's probably a petabyte of information that's flown into my, my brain. My brain will forget it all. And if it couldn't forget it, it would be dysfunctional. So, and, but it will pick up and store a lot of this chemically in the short run, and that'll quickly dissipate away fade away. But by setting this team goal, this cooperative aspect of us social, it sends a signal to the brain, this is what you have to learn. You have to remember this. That beacon of learning is what the, the program does. A lot of students get that through their parents, through different aspects, but a lot of highly at-risk students, they're not getting that signal at all. That's why this program is so critically powerful for at-risk students to be able to get that same signal, hey, the, the, this is important skills to learn and to learn permanently. So this is where we get into our, you know, basically you know, version point one of the program. We focus solely on group accountability. And we accomplish that by, like what John said, with the team, team score. So we have set a goal and we have this bar that moves across the screen as the, as the class moves and it makes their goal. We also have different keys, discipline indicators like the total points, the highest badge, medium badge, and we also have an epic goal, which basically is like setting a future goal saying when we hit that, we're going to have a pizza party or some sort of celebration to mark that moment now. So this, this goal will start out blank. The computer has figured out what the class can do if it works hard for 12 to 15 minutes, and then it will move across toward that goal. This is a, is a powerful, positive breakthrough for the class, but it's not enough. Yeah. And uh, the, the, the other stuff has to, the other breakthroughs have to be a part of it too. So here's the coolest thing about it. It's like, you know, we get this thing. Yeah. So do you guys, do you guys want to go home? Yeah. <laughs> you want to keep playing? Yeah. <laughs> I never, I never watched that, but this video is so amazing. Yeah. <laughs> you know, he says that we made it into a video game. 
But as you saw to Ronnie's screen, there it doesn't look anything like a yeah, video nothing game. Nothing like Prodigy. <laughs> but it feels like a video game to them. There's a team score. There's individual accountability. There's electricity in the air. They it it has its own magic. So we talked a little bit about the epic goal already. So let's move on to like this is a really funny. Uh, uh, this was over at Johnson. And up and up and up. Yes. Oh, that's a good question. So. So, so I had a number of you ask. So I had a number of you ask me, um, "Can you do this at home?" Well, I mean, so who here wants to do it at home? Raise your hand. And this wow, was like, you guys actually want mostly to do ELL at home? students. That is impressive. So if it's not up to me. You have to ask your teacher if, you, if that's something she wants to have. So. Third grade, so you know we, have, we saw some intense motivation, especially from these uh, these populations, so ELL, special needs, and actually even refugees. We had a teacher who <laughs> this is so this funny. Is um, um, in the first week, you know, all right. My name is uh, Aaron Argus. I teach fifth grade at a school um, here in Phoenix, Arizona. Um, it's called Sonoran Science Academy. Um, we have a unique population here. We have a large refugee population from East Africa. Um, we also have students from Iraq, Syria, Turkey, um, as well as from here um, in the state of Arizona and um, down south from Mexico. And on the first day that my students experienced it, um, you know, their excitement, you can say, was through the roof. They had all kinds of success, you know. They were solving problem after problem. They were seeing their points grow. Um, they were watching the leaderboard, um, you know, and seeing their positions change throughout that day. I've had students who were not motivated um, to go home and do homework, going home and playing this game and, you know, coming back the next day and apologizing for playing too much. Um, we've had to set rules so they don't overplay it at home. Um, but even with those rules being set, students are going home and they're not wanting to stop. I've had a student go home, walking out the day to school one day, saying, I'm not going to sleep tonight, I'm going to stay up all night. Yeah, I mean, the fact that kids are wanting to do it at home, and the fact that, I mean, I never thought I would have a student apologizing for doing too much math. So just seeing how this math fluency game has motivated the unmotivated, and has created a new spark and a new excitement for those that were already motivated and already completed their work is, is pretty amazing to see. Um, our ELL students, you know, they are coming right along. Um, you know, they're, it helps them to begin to read more closely, especially as they encounter the work problems. You know, it helps them to really zero in on that vocabulary and identify what the vocabulary um, is asking. Uh, we do have some special ed students in the room. We have four. And those students, they're flying through levels just as well. Um, one of them, their mom was calling me on the phone asking for the website. What's this you know, new game my daughter's talking about? She wants to play it. Um, so you know, it's helping students um, from all walks of life in our classroom. Yeah, this is just you know, an well, incredible thing that we saw. So let's move on to in individual accountability. So this is where we were talking about, he was talking about the leaderboard. So this is, this is the other factor that really drives the, the kids motivations. So <clears throat> we have the team score going up here, but a team score is not enough. It's the fact that it's instantaneous, right while they're playing the game, that really makes it electric. That instantaneous aspect of the team score grips students. But even that's not enough. You also have to have individual accountability, but it has to be, it can't be the regular accountability that people are used to. You each, each accountable goal, each student needs their own goal that's based on their level of motivation, their skills, their ability to keep your social cohesion. This game is all about social aspects and relationships be between students and the electricity that that can generate. So you have the LeBron James of mathematics up here who might be doing 500 math problems and you have a special ed student down here who scored zero on AZ Merit last year and they're doing 70 easier math problems but at the end of the day, they can all have an equal probability of getting to blue and being one with the group. They made their contribution necessary to get the team to its goal. So, so they're for, all still together. So for you guys to understand this as teachers, it's like this is a, these goals are adaptation, and so we calculate it to be approximately 
10 to 12 minutes. So we're saying that these, all these things should make it to that goal in about 12 minutes, and that's how we did. But then this, this also lets you do something that, uh, that, that you could never have done before, which is real-time RTI. So, so for the fifth and sixth graders, I heard that you mentioned that you, you, know, you, you, you exercise this quite, uh, quite a bit in the classroom, right? Yes? So this real-time RTI is basically, think of it this way. You know, if this is our prediction, and we get to a certain point in the, in the game, like let's say five minutes in, you notice that there's a couple students who are lagging behind, what does that mean? Well, that means that you need to go and see what they're doing, look at the problem types, and offer them advice, help, and, and inspiration. Uh, so, because for some reason, you know, this student normally has a high goal. She's at a high uh, batch level as well. But that means that they hit this new level that's giving them and tripping them up and giving them problems. So that's when you and Beam, you help them out right then and there in real time, as opposed to waiting for the next day or for the next week. Or There's two types of intervention. One, as I mentioned, this student needs help. You need to go over there and give them some hints. The other intervention is I would start watching the scoreboard as soon as the game started. And when the first score posts, I immediately go to the short bar or the missing bar. Because I've had a number of students that had really difficult home lives, and I would have to get them to shift gears emotionally from thinking about the night before to being in the game. And the, 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 the beautiful words were, Hezekiah, show me what you can do. That simple. Just you go, you go up to the student and say, show me what you can do. And the students love to be watched. I would get them going 30 seconds, and then I'd say, Hezekiah, looks like you're going to need to play six games in order to get to your goal. Can you do it? He never said no. So you, you do have to be in the flow, and you do, have, as a teacher, you have to be watching the board, and, and you have to react pretty quickly. You can't let a student get out of the game because of what other distractions might be in their life. All right, so, so that's basically the accountability aspect. But the other uh, critical thing that really makes this uh, become something that you've seen remain results is, is basically filling in the gap. So here's, you know, this is what happens in your elementary school. But the funny thing is, uh, is that the same game that you play as a second grade, as a fifth grader, sixth grader, eighth grader, <coughs> high school senior, it's the same exact game. So what it does is it's designed to fill in the gaps. So let's just listen. But I actually found out that it kind of tripped up my basic math skills, and I was like missing on some, some kind of some stuff that I should already know. And furthermore, so basically, you know, so when they're talking about that, the easiest way to picture it is like, you know, they're coming to you at whatever grade you're at, like sixth grade, fifth grade, second grade even. Uh, and they're, at, they're climbing this academic ladder. These academic ladders have standards, and they also have pacing guides of where they should be at, at every single moment of their life. So they come to you, and they're missing all these rungs because either they missed it, they never learned it, they were never, like in, in the case of the, the schools of were refugees, they have kids coming to them placed in fifth grade who had zero school before that, and they were placed in fifth grade. So they had to figure out, okay, now how do we them up to whatever the fifth grade standard is. So they have all these gaps. So what this does is like as the kids are playing this game, they're climbing the ladder. They all start at level one, like in a video game, and they start moving their way up, up the ladder. So some kids will accelerate and go up to level 10 really fast, where other kids might take their time and slowly plot away as they move up. But then, 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 then what happens is the kid that's speeding up goes to level 17, level 18, they hit the level 19, they reach up to the rung, what happens? It's missing. And then so they identify that standard, so we looked at this previous um, image, like their, their bar is not moving as fast as they were before because they hit this new level. It actually represents a standard at, let's just say, second grade and their sixth grade. So they work on it. They actually, a lot of these kids self-correct and learn that skill as they're going through this process. But, uh, but a lot of times, you know, you would identify that and you could say, okay, uh, I'm staying the board. I see that there's a big red splotch next to your name. That means you're trending in the negative, you're making mistakes, so I'm gonna come and intervene, give you some coaching advice and help you out. So as you repair that, uh, that rung of the ladder, um, it'll help them be able to tackle on more stuff. So like, like, I think it was the Cynthia, or was it um, you were saying, sorry, I'm trying to remember your name. Amber. Amber, was that like, you know, is basically we're talking about cognitive overload. So you're in sixth grade, and they're, you're teaching them whatever the sixth grade um, lesson is. You know, they're spending all their energy trying to keep this ladder with all these missing rungs in balance, doing these basic calculations. And then there's nothing left in the brain 
to, uh, to take out new information. So they go into cognitive overload. They have students um, do math inside of scanners now, and what they find out is that when a student first undertakes a task, a huge part of the brain will kick in and be working on this problem. And then as they do, after they do thousands of repetitions, it gets down to where it's just a few neurons is all that it takes to do the job. And what happens as they do this practice, it frees up cognitive resources to go on and do proportions, ratios, fractions, the more complex stuff. This is why it's so crucial that kids have all these, this volume of practice at the lower skills so they can get this down to where it takes up no, none of their cognitive uh, <coughs> so, so one of the theories that we have is why Taylor had such incredible results in just three weeks is that even though they never made it past up to the multiplication or any of the harder stuff during that time, it just wasn't enough time for them to get there. By repairing these foundational skills, they go, aha, I've repaired this wrong. All these other wrongs start to make sense now because that was like a foundational piece that was giving them that one mode of like, okay, I don't have that piece, I can't understand anything else uh, of moving up. But once they repaired these very basic pieces, they were able to answer questions on that post-test um, much more than they were for when they first entered. So, because their brains were like, okay, now things are starting to make sense, I can actually start thinking about these problems and actually come up with the answer. So, so that's the idea. So basically, we, uh, so one of our biggest jobs is like we repair, and then we extend them beyond their abilities. So, in fact, we even have some kids, like we, we experience this a lot, is that they have math PTSD. Yeah, you would see it, a student with their finger hovering over the correct answer, and their finger would be going like this and they couldn't commit because they've experienced so much humiliation in their life from academic failure and being made fun of that they literally couldn't. And then after you got, after they, you just flood them with success them having thousands and thousands of correct answers, they, they can get by that and, that, and uh, get a new identity and actually sort of erase that PTSD. Yep. So that basically speaks to what John said earlier about the success zone. We give them so much success by keeping them in a uh, well, go to the back of Terry Scott's well, research. Well, what Terry Scott has found out out of Kentucky is that students need at least three successes for every one failure in order to have optimal academic growth. And he found that half of all the classrooms in the United States actually exist below this, thresh, this threshold. And so what the software does, it looks at each student and it works towards getting them into that success zone. It's not perfect though. That's why you as a teacher have to be monitoring the situation. And when you see those lights go red, go over and, and encourage the student and, and work with them at that point. Yeah, exactly. So basically we're taking them from drowning to basically surfing on top of the waves in the ocean. You late taking the, the math, the abilities that they learned math and, and now they're basically making it like what Durrani was doing, really, seem effortless in a way. So do you have enough time to run the simulation? Um, I was going to probably say that. So I guess it's very random. Okay. Yeah. So, um, so basically, you know, just kind of help you guys understand uh, how the system works on, on the back end. You know, let's say, let's pretend that your st students working out is at look badge or level 27. So, 50% of the questions coming at them are coming from that uh, that I think. So, so only 50% of the questions are from that I think that they're working on. Then we have what we call floor pressure. 20% are are being spiraled in from the level above. So it's being slowly introduced. So they might be they might be getting it, they might not be getting it, but that's okay because it's just being slowly introduced so that when they ratchet up to the next level, they're not going to be in, in shell shocked. <laughs> and then also 30% is what we call back pressure. So taking questions from the levels that they previously mastered so that just to keep them in the su success zone. So they're working on the core bank, they're being slowly introduced to this new problem type that's going to that's come up next, and then they're still answering questions that we've already determined that they have fluency in. So uh, that's what we call the success zone. So remember, it all goes back to the beacon of learning. You want to keep, make sure that they're learning, but they're not just learning temporarily, but, but they're learning for permanence of that. So uh, John mentioned this a little bit about uh, how the beacons work. So traditionally, the beacons come from parents, peers, community. If you live in like uh, an affluent area, you, know, you have all these singles that tell you, okay, I'm, uh, I'll, I'm, I'm here, to, I'm going to have academic success, I'm part of the academic You can tell my partner was born in Taiwan. <laughs> so, we do yeah. know how to, to oh, spell I signals. I correct that. <laughs> I don't know, that's, that's supposed to be a different version. But then, you know, but then um, we moved on. 
So basically, what we're trying to do is recreate that. Now, I'm not going to play this video, but one of the things that this uh, uh, in the Native American schools that we saw is that it affected their attendance. So these kids went from from not wanting to go to school to actually wanting to go to school to the point where, like, you know, actually, I'll just show the students have started talking about at recess time what their goals are, okay. their classmates. So it's a whole, whole group effort. It's no longer just myself and I. They celebrate them outside the classroom with their peers. They are data driven for themselves. On so they know their, their scores, their statistics, their levels. In fact, when John and I visit schools, Kids will like uh, yell at us and say, I'm at level 17, I just I just beat the uh, the Zombot level or something like that. They're so proud of their accomplishment, accomplishments. So one of the exercises we uh, came up with uh, this year that's uh, you know really tailored towards uh, upper grades, but we but we I want to see like how you guys as those well as elementary school teachers could come up with some really great activities uh, that that kind of do the same thing as this. So think of it this way, you know, what we do is like we have the teachers have the we have the students keep a daily log, so they have this like notebook next to them, and after every game uh, day, they would they would log their, their their data. They would have their their three points of data, points, how many correct they have, and how much time they 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 spent in the system. So that those numbers keep going up, and then after about a, a few weeks, then what we do is we tell them, okay, let's look, let's let's take these data points and let's plot them on a graph. Let's calculate the slope. Let's calculate delta v. What is delta v? Oh. Velocity, okay. But I mean, I know these concepts might be too high for for the elementary school kids. But but what I want to do is like I want you to think of some creative ways to take these data points and make it something that they could feel accomplished with. Like they could start charting their own growth, their craft, their trajectory, and then they could go, okay, this is just more than just get, earning a badge and how many points. But they could actually start looking at this and massaging the data, because the kids love that. Like play, they play video games and they're inundated with data. And statistics and things like that, so they're familiar with that in video games. You know, think think about like just look at Fortnite. You know, how many how many data points does that game have? So, but taking that and then now it's applying directly to their personal growth, that really drives home and, and brings a lot of huge buy-in with the kids uh, as well. So, I don't know, is this appropriate for sixth grade? You think doing something like this? It gets into a little bit of ge geometry in a way, but. <laughs> We don't, yeah. We're not there yet. Yeah, but you got to think of some way to really. They data plot. They can plot. They can well. plot it, but plot. yeah. But that language is not part of their. Well, yeah, it's not part of it. But then they'll they'll, they'll build an understanding of it. So we so want to think about ways to to come up with uh, that kind of that kind of, that kind of exercise and really bring it home. And then we're gonna go to uh, uh, we, some things we saw. Like one of the coolest things is like you know um, we see that the students are building their own personal algorithms. So as they're moving through the program. They're not. They're they're learning through the process, and they're building these algorithms in their head to get through the next level. So a lot of this stuff that doesn't even require direct instruction. These kids are basically magically coming up with their own because by doing the volumes of questions that they're doing, their brains are forming these linkages uh, and and pathways that uh, is pretty natural to human development. Uh, in fact, like you know, in the elementary school, uh, in, the, in the middle school, and high school level, we work with kids who don't even know how to deconstruct problems, and we had teachers tell us that we, they saw kids doing that without even being taught that skill, or maybe they discovered it some other way. But it's just incredible. Um, but also, the best thing is that it wakes them up. So uh, this is uh, Stern, Stephen Stern, and he talks about how after playing the game, you go into your instruction, and these kids are a lot more receptive to to your um, to your instruction. Regular instruction because you know after doing an intense like 100 200 questions in 10 to 15 minutes, then you're like okay you know I'm going to be able to respond to whatever's being taught. In fact, we used to, we also see the kids become what we call mathematically aggressive. Right, John? Yeah, that they that I had I had two students who were literally mute. And they were the they had scored zero on AZ Merit, and after a while I came to understand it was their way of protecting themselves. But as they got in there, both those students were doing over 240 math problems correct by the end of the year, and you could see them start to open up as that process began, and then all of a sudden, they had experienced enough success, they were mathematically aggressive about taking under, undertaking new things that the regular teacher was teaching in their regular instruction. They, they all, all of a sudden, when you've had hundreds if not thousands of successes, you can take a failure or two without feeling emotionally damaged. And or emotionally at risk, you have a lot of confidence in yourself. 
Okay, so let's talk about what's the, this is, this will be uh, more for the fifth and sixth graders, but for, yeah, you had a question? I'm just concerned it's 250. But yeah, we're almost then, done. And you are coming back, right, to support two? Yes, yeah, we're gonna come up with a schedule for, so we're gonna get to those options here. Okay, yeah, we're good. awesome. So let's look at what's new. So one thing that we discovered is what we call recursive loops uh, at the end of the school, school last year. I, I think we told you about the restarting at the end, end of the year. So we're actually practicing that on a very extreme uh, scale right now uh, yeah. at one school, or two schools actually. Well, what we have is we had a um, third grade over at the Wilson Elementary School, um, and the student, the teacher there was extraordinary. And what happened is that the students went, went skyrocketing up, and then they, they sort of ran out of steam. And so we decided, okay, we'll start them back at zero. So this had taken, I think, four or five months, and then the set, so they went back to zero, and we made it psychologically acceptable to the students, because at first they were sort of reacting, oh, I'm at level 28, and I'm going all the way back, back to zero. But we gave them a challenge to get back up to where they were. So it took four months to get to level 30, three weeks to get back there. So, it so was that, fun. Was, that was the, the, and something magical happened on the route back to that level. You had a number of students in the bottom third that went up to the top third. So it was the bottom third students whose identities had changed and just the process of going back up on that recursive loop. So we have come to believe that recursive loops are gonna be a huge part of the breakthrough at the lower grade levels for getting students to, to changing everything. So yeah, so that was one of the things that we're doing and we're doing it on an extreme case now. This is something that we're gonna to need to discuss with especially the second and third graders. Uh, but basically at the uh, thir uh, fourth and fifth and sixth grade, we could do a recursive cycle probably once every month or two, or depending on what's going on. So it's a lot of observation on how the students are performing, and then we go, okay, let's do it again, and then they see their growth. It's phenomenal. The kids are like, wow, it, it took me this long to get to here, now it takes me a fraction of the time. Uh, so like, you know, um, so one of the things that we want to discuss with, uh, with you guys is like one of our ca cases that we're doing, and we don't have to do it this way with your particular class, but it's an option, is that we're having them recursively cycle every single day of the week, which means that, like, you know, in the That's example, the, the second grade class I have now, they're, they, they are recursively cycling every day, so they have a Monday account, a Tuesday account, on through a Friday account, and, and it's been phenomenal. They, they're the class that I told you that did 5,000 math problems this morning. Now, they are the easiest of math problems, but, they, it is the energy that they're picking up in there and the phenomenal amount of success. So it's, it is, it appears to be going very successful. So I want to put it now, this is experimental. We're seeing great success with it, but it's an option to you if you want to approach it this way, as opposed to the traditional way, which is running the program uh, as, as a one account. So think of it this way. The kids come in, they do Monday account, and the kid gets to level, let's say, three or something like that. And they go, the next day they get to level five, from level zero to five. And then they just, every day they get a little farther. And they come back to the Monday account, and they start at level three, and all of a sudden they're up to level 10. So they're basically, you know, zigzagging up. It's, it's, it's a very interesting experiment, and it's something that, that we've uh, optionally available to whoever wants to try that methodology. So, all right, let's get into a really quick uh, level of training, because um, a lot of the things that we, when we talk about is, uh, um, is basically how to get things started. So one of the um, uh, things that we've done uh, last year was was uh, come and start up your, kick off your classroom and start it up. But you don't have to wait for us to schedule something. If you want to get going, we have this really detailed now, <laughs> if we didn't have really great instruction back then, but now we actually have this step-by-step step step instruction that takes you through every single thing that we do when John and I come to your classroom. So we go, Step one, we introduce the game. And number two, we talk about this. Number three, we talk about that. And so on and so forth. So we actually detailed out everything that we did to get started. So, so we have teachers all around the country who followed this guide and had found great success. So, so if you don't want to wait for us to schedule a time to get your class kick, kick off, then you can just follow this. So I'll be emailing you this instruction so you can look it over and see. All of your, all of your uh, classes are all set up and ready to go. Uh, it also goes into, uh, you know, 
more additional information as well. So the yeah. accounts are already created? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, he did that for us. Yep. Yeah. All of your students are set up. Did you change the login? Yes. I'm on yes, it, uh, the logins are changed, so I'll okay. get to that. So, so, so if you want to have John and I come and kick off your class now for fifth and sixth grade, you guys are good to go on your own. You've got the experience. You don't have to you know, have us come in. But if you want us to come in and help, if you feel... Uh, uh, and we are glad, and I would strongly recommend to the second, second graders, graders that, yes. that uh, you know, it, it is, it's going to be a challenge. I mean, it, it, but the login process and, and just getting used to that, understanding the, the challenges on the first day for second grade, um, the more help you have in there, the better. Okay, and so if the you can students recruit log in. Volunteer, that's good. Here's how the students log in. They go to the website uh, in the instructor seat as provided, and it's their student ID at porter19.com. So that's basically what they type in. All their passwords are unified uh, to this one password, which we love to say is, one. Well, they'll never forget, which is 123. So, <laughs> so we do that on purpose because we got tired of t kids trying to figure out what they typed and using the, their password that was set up by position. We're like, okay, well, let's just get rid of that. Let's just do one, two, three. And it's been great ever since then. Um, so the teacher logins will be uh, this. Basically, it's Porter. And then whatever your grade level is, it'll say second at mpsad.org. And all your passwords are is KT lowercase. So, so it would be Porter third or Porter fourth. Porter fourth, is it a four CH? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So basically, it's whatever, you know, the school and then your uh, designated grade level. So I'm sorry, I'm not there. We're sharing the same login? Yes. Okay. So basically, we've unified every grade to, so that no one's using their own. Because we got into the whole entire thing, like a teacher left, and now we have to. So now it's like everybody's got this uh, generic account so that you guys can log in at any time uh, and, and, and know the exact format. So it's not. Uh, specific uh, to any one teacher. So if something happens, then we could just change the name of the class, whatever it is. So that's how you get in uh, to do that. Um, now, the other consideration that we have is we've added some 20 new early levels uh, to the program that, that focus on number identification, counting, very simple mathematics, like, you know, zero plus one uh, and iterations of that. Because last year we learned that even zero through five, was too hard for a lot of kids. So yeah, we have we have to get them, and I've I even have found some stuff about myself doing the counting stuff. Is I can look at three, say three, four, say four. I get to five, I got to count. You know, six, seven, eight, nine. But the students, as they get into this, they can look at nine and type nine. So they can just see nine after they yeah. do this enough. So, so there's a real fluency aspect to those lower skills. So this is something that's basically what we would call new and experimental and highly needed, especially at the early grade levels, like first, second, and even third grade. But, but, but for you teachers at you know, third through sixth, you know, we could, depending on how your kids are, so you, you have to kind of like uh, give us your general uh, uh, feeling about your kids. That do they need number, number identification? Do they need counting? Do they need very basic simple math? Sixth grade, maybe not. So, so of those 20 levels, we at, at fifth and sixth grade, what we do is we eliminate it down to two of these core levels, uh, and then basically it's, uh, they don't have to work on it. But then in some cases, we find that some sixth graders do need more of that. So, so the early levels, the the pre levels uh, before we get to level one, uh, is something that can be can be can be adapted and molded to your specific grade. So if, if you uh, sixth graders, you feel like okay. We don't need this, then we'll, we'll remove it. Or, or you can do it this way. Okay, we're gonna do it, and after a couple days, we see how the kids are, and then we're gonna remove it. So we can actually remove those levels at any time during the process. So, uh, so John, like in the second graders, he ran the early levels, and, or, and, and after about a week, we removed number identification and got them into counting. So, so for a lot of kids, depending on their aptitude, we kind of have to uh, mold it uh, to your group specifically. Because we found that these kids need the most basic of basics that we assume that they should have. And that was a we, we, we run into students all the way up to sixth grade who have trouble counting. And we'll get significant error rates in the counting part of this. So you can tell that they, they actually, it can be beneficial to them 
we, we think that all of this can be beneficial, even the most advanced students. So you might want to let it run for a, a, a couple days before you take out the levels. At the beginning, they'll just be literally type 7. They'll be hitting the 7 and hitting the inner key. So they'll be getting their keyboard skills flowing. But they're also building up a success level. They're having, they're showing that they can control this thing. So it's it's more beneficial than it would appear on the surface. And, and you know, and we're learning through this process a little. We just introduced these levels this summer, so we only had a small batch of kids going through it. So now we're, we're getting more and more, like you know, the second graders were the first real strong batch that we totally threw them at, and then and, and we observed it. So yeah, so this is something that basically we'll need to work together on, and feeling out those early levels and what's needed and what's, what's not needed, because we just can't make the assumption that they all can jump into zero plus five. Uh, that was just, that, that, that was an improper assumption on our part, so, that we thought would have been fine. <laughs> so, uh, so basically that's pretty much it for the training. I mean, we got the documentation which walks you through every single step. But let me just show you, that after you log in, you'll have your class, and you click on the hat, and then you click on Fluency 2020, which is over here on the left, um, because this is a two-step process. Because this first step takes you to a code which you won't be needing because we set up all the accounts for you, but, but uh, if you do need it, this is where the course code is over here on the top right. And if you click yeah, on it. So if you have a new student come in, you're going to need this course code right here. It's a relatively simple thing to create a new account for a new student, or you can, you'll need that course code. Or you can email us and we'll do it for you. Uh, but we'll send you an instruction. But then you click on that, this takes you to the leaderboard, which then, well, uh, this is the button that we were talking about which sets the goal, so a little circle with the dot, you click on that, they'll set the goal for. So in this particular class so far, they've done 47,000 points, 17,000 problems correct, and their cumulative hours of time on task is 47 hours. And who is that one student? John Hoopenthal. <laughs> he spent 47 hours on this, on this game. <laughs> Well, somebody's got to test it to make sure the software works. <laughs> yeah, anyway, so this is a, one of our test accounts. But the thing is, like, that's all you do is you, you click, the, you make those clicks, you set the goal, and then the, the goal will be set for, for the, the class, and then, and then you run it. And that's pretty much it. So um, I know we, we ran a little over time, but I appreciate your Thank attention. You your now, do you have any questions from anybody at all? Uh, it's going to be emailed to you, but it's lms.kpcompass.com. So, um, so let me just pull, pull it up here so you can see it. It's item number four on the instructions. That doesn't work. And, and that's not working either. Okay. Well, here it is. Uh, this is a live Google Doc. So if somebody's looking at it, they're going to see it going all weird. So there we go. But this, this, the uh, website, how to log in, all this information to and uh, lms.kpcompass.com, and uh, and basically uh, any, everything you need will be emailed to you uh, tonight, uh, so that you guys can. For those of you who want to get started tomorrow, you can very well do that. All the kids are set up uh, if, according to the roster I received two weeks ago. So if any changes have been made, uh, email to me and I'll add them, or uh, just send you the information on how to. And, and, I, and, I, and I would just strongly recommend for the second grade, having seen what I've seen, I started up a second grade class yesterday, I went to it again today, I have this other class that's been running for 14 days, I would strongly recommend the recursive cycles. It just seems to be working extraordinarily well. And uh, so um, let, me, let me know, and uh, also I would strongly recommend that you have me there on the first day. It's going to be painful getting the students going and you need uh, all the emotional support you can get and uh, if we can recruit another adult um, having three people in the classroom for that startup day and maybe even the first mm -hmm. five startup days because it, it, their time will come down rapidly it'll come from like it might even take you your students a little longer because you get one more layer on your system unless we can somehow give, give use a shortcut. Well do they have a, are their computers assigned or are they randomly given to them? How is that? Okay, they're assigned? Well, okay, so if they're assigned, then the active directory login process will be so much quicker. But if they're randomly given, then you know how long it takes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, well, we will help you with through it. And the thing you can know from our experience is that log on time will come down, down, down. Well, especially with the active directory, we'll be able to put a shortcut. When they click on that link, 
it's going to auto-populate their email and password. So they just have to get logged into the Active Directory, which we, we, we see is probably the biggest barrier in, uh, uh, in Mesa, uh, is getting the kids in through, the, through the Active Directory account. And once they're in, just click on the KB Compass icon, which gets installed on their uh, computers, and then the password should be saved. Um, according to direct Now, directory. those of you who just listened to Naya, I didn't understand really a word he said. Does that, did what he said make sense to you? Okay, so good. <laughs> uh, there, there, on the instructions, there is a, there is a part where you, you go through that process, and if we're there, we'll take you through that. So these instructions are basically everything we say and do during the time that we hear. So it's almost like having us there, but not. <laughs> Anyway, so that's great. So everyone excited about getting getting your kids started? Yeah, awesome. Well, we can't wait to well, see thank you for extraordinary for bearing us a few more minutes. We appreciate it. We know how long your day's been already, and uh, we're excited about uh, coming out, and helping you uh, start your classes, or finding out uh, how how it goes when you start them up yourself. And do I have everyone's current email address? Yeah, I don't think I have the new teachers. Is the spreadsheet didn't have the email address? I could guess. I have the old ones. <laughs> yeah. So maybe if you send me a, a, a complete list, uh, that would be. Uh, and, the, and the other thing. In case I don't have what, them, what's, I have it. What's critical is we would love, our schedules are pretty chaotic, but if we have free time, we want to be in your classes uh, helping you. And so if we know, if you develop a standard time of when you're going to be running it, if we know that and we have time, we will come here and we will help help you. Yeah. And we. We've learned over time sort of how to flow among the students and spot them quickly. And so, so for instance, Salk, uh, they actually created a spreadsheet of all the teachers and when they were running, what, are, what the projected time of what they're running the math program on a daily basis because it changed. In that case, it changes daily. So that way we'll be able to help you more. So we'll be like, hey, we got some time. Let's drop in and, and see how and, and, and help you out, whatever is going on. So, so that's, that's that. Um, well, thank you. Yeah. Thank Thanks. you. Yeah. Awesome. And then, thanks for sharing your experiences. It's, it's, yeah. it's, it's really yeah, great to have, have, that, um, have that experience and then be able to share firsthand what you got from it last year. So.